Welcome back, friends. Uh, week six of the eight-week series, so we're, we're uh, moving on, uh, and uh, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, perhaps. Um, so today, uh, we want to talk about social justice uh, as it comes to us out of Scripture, as we relate to it in the world around us, and then as we as professionals relate to it. Uh, <clears throat> what are the responsibilities we have in the uh, obligations and uh, the things that we need to be learning and being aware of uh, in order to come up to this uh, particular uh, reality. Uh, let me talk about justice uh, in particular, uh, justice as a priority. I'm going to suggest that, that there are two primary ways to, to look at justice. Um, one is the justice that comes out of relationship. What is fair in relationship? And I suspect that's the one that, is, that we most often meet. Uh, it's one we uh, learn in families. Uh, I'm thinking of my uh, a friend of ours uh, who had a, a little girl named <coughs> Anne. She was the oldest of the kids, and sometimes things didn't go the way she thought they did, and she would sit in the middle of the, f the floor and say, unfairness to Anne, injustice to Anne. And finally, her mom looked her in the eye and said, Sweetheart, life is not fair. <laughs> Let's uh, you know, see what's happening here. See what your younger sisters and brothers need and see that you are well cared for. Well cared for. And so uh, out of that sense, I mean, the, the relational fairness, uh, what, what works for us uh, as people, um, it's different. Uh, there's a different kind of uh, set of, of things that we think about when we ask, uh, what about justice in the larger world? And, uh, and when we enter the, the question of social justice uh, and political, what is justice uh, politically? Uh, that's a different language and a different feel. And I'm going to sort of go back and forth between those two as we talk about the, the relational, the justice that comes at the fairness that we feel because we're who we are in close relationship, but also the fairness we have to think about in terms of especially our nation, which is supposedly uh, a, uh, a nation dedicated to the proposition that we're all equal <laughs> and therefore there should be equal justice for all. Uh, I'm going to first, concerning that, that um, public justice, I'm going to briefly talk about four areas uh, in which it is de defined. And I'm not going to belabor them if this is something you're interested in. A lot of uh, um, uh, opportunities and resources online to take a look at this. Um, but fairness is generally divided into four aspects. So that uh, fairness could, could be understood as distributive justice, a justice where everybody gets their share and um, have fair access to goods. Uh, I think you can think of some examples like uh, uh, just a, a living wage or perhaps health care. Um, there's a second area, procedural justice, where there's fair play. If there's a problem, if one raises a problem, is that heard fairly? And is it, uh, is it worked at fairly? Is the process fair? And there's our judicial system and, uh, and, and the strengths and weaknesses we have uh, there. A third area is restorative justice, the justice that places someone back in the position that they lost. Uh, and so that allows someone to renew and find a level, level playing field again. And, uh, and the fourth element, um, retributive justice, which we call punishment, uh, the justice that says you did wrong, and, uh, and there has to be a, 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 an acknowledgement of that, and there has to be recuperations for that. Nursing has a big... Uh, connection with justice. There's a, it's always been important for nursing. Florence Nightingale set the tone uh, when she was in the Crimea and she came back and uh, she went to Parliament and she went to the King and she said, we have to take care of those who are weak. You are, you are caring about the, the, the wealthy people in the, in the nation, you're sending people out to war and you're not taking care of the soldiers. So we need to put resources uh, and we need to take advantage and, and, and take responsibility for what's happening uh, in, the, uh, in the trenches. Nursing justice often focuses on um, advocacy on behalf of, uh, of vulnerable populations. 
uh, those are the people that you see. And you care about when a, when a group of people is not getting this a, a fair shake uh, in terms of health care uh, or whatever it is. And so that tends to be the issue that comes up in, in nursing. And I, I'm, I want to point out that that comes to us usually in a relational context. We see a family that is suffering and we suffer with them. And then we would like to transfer that to the language of social and political justice. And it does take a transference. Uh, it takes maybe a little skill or even a calling uh, where someone would do that. But there is that sense in which out of the awareness of a, of a relational injustice comes the need to transfer that into, the, into a language that more people will pick up and that will see that it's a question of the strength of our society and the fairness of our society. So there's a, there's a place where these two voices work. Uh, the, uh, the language of, of uh, relationship and the language then of larger civic justice. In that, um, and I'm again just a little more uh, sort of um, introduction of some ideas. Uh, an idea that I heard a few years ago that has made a lot of sense to me just precisely in this area is what's referred to as the three spheres of discourse. Three spheres of discourse. The idea is that, uh, that there's, a, there's a private kind of conversation you have when you're trying to convince somebody of something. Uh, there's a different conversation that you have if you are in a technical context or a community context where you are saying, you know, we need to make some changes and we have shared values. Um, and, you know, nursing might say, uh, you know, uh, do no harm and therefore we need to pursue this issue and, and, and resolve these problems that are happening. Uh, that would be a, a, a public, uh, sorry, a, a, a community. It's not quite public yet. It's a community discussion uh, or even a technical discussion. And the third area then is uh, public discourse, which sounds uh, very different and ca is carried on with a certain uh, tone. Uh, one time that this really came uh, to my attention and, and I, I saw, I was reading about this and then suddenly in the news, uh, there was a woman who was teaching in a local high school. She was the wife of the Assemblies of God minister and she was teaching uh, science. And so she was asked, uh, did she teach creation or evolution? And she said uh, she believed in, in creation and so she in her, uh, it was not a public school, it was a private school, so she was teaching uh, creation and she was talking about the flaws of evolution, but she was not positively teaching evolution as a topic. And the reporter said to her, asked her this question, do you believe that God is uh, behind you in this? And she said, well, I certainly hope so. Okay. I would say that <laughs> about a lot of things. <laughs> But I'm not sure I would want that to be the leading point when my face hits the newspaper. Dave Dorman thinks God is behind him. <laughs> but that's what happened to this, uh, to this teacher. God believes that she, God, she believes that God wants her to teach evolution in the school. And so it was, again, do you see what I'm saying? Is that the, the problem when what I would say in my family or what I would say in my church and in the community is spoken in the same way in public, and there's a, a willingness to hear it in a different way. Uh, so three spheres of discourse, just an awareness that we talk about different things in different ways. If I'm gonna convince uh, my family that we should have um, <clears throat> something different on the table on uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas, I argue in a certain way. You know, Well, mom always used to say something like that. Uh, if I'm arguing for a change or wanting to see a change in workplace or church, I talk about it in a different way with the shared values. And I, I'm not a public uh, politician, but when I engage in public politics, I'm thinking about things on a different level. And when I finally vote yes, no, this name, that name, um, it's uh, the awareness of that I'm, I'm in a public setting is it partly affects what I'm thinking. So uh, I'm going to say this leads us to basically two voices in politics and uh, injustice. 
Uh, it's been said um, that all politics is local politics. Maybe that's true, I, and I think the point is that if you're going to make a point politically, if you're going to advocate for uh, health care for all uh, on the national level, what you want to be showing is that you're making a local case. So you bring local people, you mention their lives, you mention their situations, and, uh, uh, and, and this is what can uh, be accomplished in that. Um, but there is the need to then transfer to understand the, the, the personal, to understand the relational, to understand the community, and then to be able to put it in terms that become not just me requiring my values to be projected onto you, but that the shared values that we have as a nation uh, get to be uh, accepted and get to be furthered in that sense. Point number two, uh, Let's go take a look at uh, scripture in the Old Testament and see what's there. And I'm going to uh, uh, suggest that what we do find is that the relational side of justice is powerful and perhaps is the heart of where we come from. I mean, if we, that if ultimately I, I perhaps will argue that unless we begin with the depth of value and the context of relationship, then our national and public uh, uh, concerns with justice are not going to look very deep or, or healthy. So take a look with me then at some of uh, the Old Testament and the passages there. Uh, the starting place is that uh, we understand uh, in the Old Testament that Israel as a nation uh, was a covenant community. If you remember, we talked about covenant community has a structured relationship. Uh, so it's a relationship with responsibilities, obligations, strategies. Uh, but it's a relationship. God calls uh, the people of Israel into a relationship. To love God, that's relational. To love each other, that's relational. Uh, and then also to do uh, and, to, uh, and to become involved. In that context then, um, Israel is called to be a just nation. To love God, to love each other means that we will be looking for justice, looking for injustice and looking to, to correct it. So uh, se several points here that, uh, that I'll mention, and I'll kind of do it quickly uh, and look at some passages in Scripture here. Uh, first of all, to say that this comes out of God's own personal justice. He's a God who is, is just. He's fair. Uh, out of his love, it means that he cares uh, deeply for each one. And, uh, and so... Uh, and so justice is defined in the Old Testament as God's own justice. It's defined, d defined personally. A uh, reading from Psalm 7, 9 through 11, uh, we hear the, uh, the psalm say, psalmist, Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. I'm going to remind you that the righteous are those who fulfill covenant. Establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts. O oh, righteous God, God is my shield who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous God and a God who has indignation every day. So covenant community is run by God. A just reality in community is run by God according to the Old Testament. It's God that insists. It's God that's aware, who looks for injustice and justice every day and uh, asks his community to be a part. So that's the second point. Uh, God calls Israel into just relationship, uh, into uh, just covenant. Uh, Jeremiah, sorry, Jeremiah 9, 23, 24, uh, God promises, uh, <clears throat> I will uphold you with my righteousness. I will uphold you in the way you go with my own righteousness. And so, uh, we are called into uh, a, a relationship with others that is just. That's the part of the love, but it has this specific element as well, that we're called into justice with each other. Thirdly, I love this point. Uh, you may appreciate it too, that the just person is the one who strengthens the community. I'm not just after my own benefit, but as I move in justice in all the ways that that means, it means that the community is, uh, is being is being strengthened. Uh, Proverbs 29.7 tells us that the righteous know the rights of the poor, 
They're aware of them. They, if I'm righteous, it's not just that I'm going to take care of my own family, but I'm aware of, of society as well and, and aware of the needy in society, and I'm going to be uh, fulfilling uh, my obligations there and being aware. Uh, it follows uh, the, set, the fourth point. A just person must depend on a relationship with God for a just life. Uh, he is the one who is righteous. He's the one who supports my righteousness. He's the one who is faithful in covenant. And as I move uh, to be faithful in covenant, that is what uh, he supports. It's also true, uh, important, and it's very clear in the Old Testament, that justice includes uh, not only um, support, but includes, uh, it includes punishment of failure, and, uh, and it also includes forgiveness. So uh, God's justice means he will support me in, in, the, ways in, in the right ways I'm going, uh, but he, he will um, correct me, uh, and he will punish. But as, as God's love actually is, he also makes the way throughout the Old Testament and the New for forgiveness as we recognize errors and faults and wish to do something better. Uh, he is the God who extends forgiveness always, every time. And that is a part of his justice, part of his love. He extends that forgiveness as well so that the community can continue in wholeness and not be a broken community because of the problems that are there. Uh, an important point in the Old Testament and uh, an important point, I would think, think for us as professionals, that the oppressed are... Um, a particular focus of God's uh, justice. Exodus 22, I'll read um, verses 21 uh, to 23. You shall not wrong or oppress a resident alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. You shall not abuse any widow or orphan. If you do abuse them when they cry out to me, I will surely heed their cry. My wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children orphans. Mm. God is willing to turn the tables on those who don't have that particular appreciation for, uh, for the, uh, the vulnerable in the land. Uh, and notice that it includes not only the needy, the widows, the orphans, the ones without perhaps access uh, to a living wage uh, and other uh, things that society will give, but also the aliens that live in our midst. A huge uh, emphasis in scripture uh, that those who have come to Israel and are living and are willing to participate in community are accepted as covenant members fully on the basis of their, uh, their relationship. Uh, they're accepted as well. Let me read, uh, if I have it marked, uh, from Psalm, Psalm 82, one through four. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of God's, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. So this is the community that God calls us to. Uh, to love and justice responsibility for others. It's a hard call. I'll tell you what, uh, he promises that in his faithfulness, he will support us uh, in what needs to be done, but he doesn't relinquish the call. He doesn't minimize the call. He is there every day looking for righteousness and unrighteousness and wishes particularly to support those who have the deepest need. And this is, I think, the uh, emphasis that we find in the Old Testament on justice. In the New Testament, uh, all of that context is picked up. It's, it's affirmed. This is accepted as the reality. And uh, of course, then what the uh, Gospels, what the New Testament offers is the way in which Jesus walks in that reality and how he affirms that reality and how he extends that reality in his own amazing way. Jesus, uh, one of his favorite uh, topics in preaching was that he would preach the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is here. People would say, gee, what is the kingdom of God? And he'd say, that's a good question. And then he'd te tell a parable. And the parable was often about how we seek God or how we deal with each other. Uh, and, uh, and so 
and, and what happens is that the, the language of justice gets, uh, gets worked into the, uh, uh, the, the promise of the coming of the kingdom of God. Uh, <clears throat> Luke chapter 4 gives us a, uh, a moment where Jesus is beginning his ministry and, uh, and having been in some communities, having preached, having healed, having touched people, he comes back to Nazareth to his hometown and um, and and they say you know tell us what you're doing in fact they bring him into the synagogue allow him to preach and he picks up the passage uh, from Isaiah and he he preaches on this passage and he he again he's affirming what uh, the Old Testament is saying but it's coming to a very different and a powerful and new and fresh reality in his own ministry so Luke 4 and I'll read uh, from 16 to 19. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, to reco recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Yeah, powerful, powerful things. I've come to help, he says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to serve, to help, and to lift. Similarly, Jesus taught uh, in occasionally, uh, definitely addressing those who are marginalized in society. He, he, again, he brought forward the message that it's particularly those who are uh, that how we deal with those on the margins is, the, is perhaps the measure of the justice of our society in general. And I'll refer again to Mark 5 that we looked at together. Uh, a story of, uh, first of all, uh, he goes to a, a, a demoniac that's been caught, tossed out of the town and uh, he heals the demoniac, goes across the water and encounters the woman with a flow of blood that no one is paying attention to except him. He turns to her and he heals her. And then the little girl who died, and everyone says, nah, don't bother with that, she's dead. And Jesus says, let's take a look and see what the little girl, uh, if she has a future or not. And he goes and, uh, and touches her. Very aware, especially perhaps in Luke's gospel, we see him aware of the poor and of women uh, and of their particular needs uh, in a society that uh, tended to suppress the rights uh, and the dignity of both. Um, we see in Jesus' ministry uh, as well that uh, we see a contrast between the justice that he wants to bring uh, and the justice that we, we find in uh, the assumptions of the Pharisees. Now, uh, the Pharisees in Jesus' day probably dominated the, the, the sense, the feel of, uh, of the day uh, in terms of what Judaism was. There were other groups. There were the, the, the Sadducees were uh, more in political control, um, but the Pharisees had the ear of the people, and they were very strong on the law. So they, for them, you live according to the law. If you don't live according to the law, uh, there's really no hope for you. And, uh, and, and then so, you know, get with the program. <laughs> So they didn't know what to make of Jesus because he was going around forgiving people and doing some things that they would never have done. And one was uh, to actually heal someone on the Sabbath day. Uh, and uh, uh, and they seemed to, he seemed to be uh, contradicting the law of rest on the Sabbath. And so why would you heal anyone on the Sabbath? They don't ask the question, why would God heal anyone on the Sabbath? <laughs> what was his day of rest? Uh, I think that's the appropriate question, but they ask, why is Jesus doing this? And so I'm going to read from uh, Mark chapter 3, 1 through 6, just to get a glimpse of this exchange uh, between the Pharisees' values at this point and Jesus' values that he's pushing, that he's living for at this point. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had with, with the withered hand, he said, stand forward. Then he said to them, 
Is it lawful to do good or harm on the Sabbath? Okay, so that's the question. Is it lawful to do harm or to do no harm if it's on the Sunday or the Saturday in this case? <clears throat> Is it lawful to do good or harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around him at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against Jesus how to destroy him. Uh, so uh, do you see that uh, difference? They're dealing with what they think is a, the Pharisees, a public form of justice uh, in which the nation can survive. And Jesus is saying, you are not being relational. You're not dealing with people as they, they are. In fact, you are lacking humanity in your lacking of understanding who God is. Now, with the Old Testament and the New Testament, God's justice includes uh, very much support and healing and restoration. It also includes punishment and forgiveness. Jesus warns the Pharisees and other groups, you know, if you're, you're not hearing what God is saying right now, you may have a problem uh, to come, and, uh, 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 and you need to watch out for that. But Jesus, more so perhaps than any other figure that we have in the Bible or perhaps in the world, he is most especially about the forgiveness that follows when we re we're willing to put aside uh, those things that are against uh, what, what God wishes us to be and to do. And Jesus himself, of course, is the great figure of that. At the cross, he receives the judgment of God as if, as if it were his to receive. And by rising, then, he allows us to, uh, to step into his life and for our forgiveness, for our sins to be uh, crucified with him on the cross so that we can have another chance. Uh, and move forward. And it's all about acknowledging our wrongs, being ready to change, and finding a fresh, a, a freshness uh, of new life uh, in the Lord. It's a really good deal. Jesus knows about the two voices, though, and I think it's uh, interesting to read a parable in Luke 18 where uh, he is describing a woman who has a problem and, and, and she's, she's trying to take it to the judge, and the judge is in his own world and he's not listening. And I think, that, listen to the two voices here, the, the relational and then the more manipulative uh, uh, and even political uh, understanding of, his, uh, of the judge. I think it's uh, an interesting comparison. So Luke 18, uh, 1 through 8. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for the people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this woman keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his dear ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find any faith on earth? No. Pray always uh, and don't diminish that appreciation that God is uh, who God is. The other uh, very poignant and tragic uh, difference we see, the two voices of, of the community voices and the national voices in, in Jesus' life, is that uh, is in his uh, trial and crucifixion, um, because the Jews were not, did not have the power under Rome to execute any prisoners, because the group of temple leaders wanted to execute Jesus, they had to first condemn him in their own community rules, and then they had to go across the street and take Jesus to Pilate 
and they had to try to condemn him according to Rome's rules. So we have that shift. It's a negative example, a very bad example of, uh, of how community desires are explained in public terms and therefore something gets it done. But they accuse Jesus of blasphemy. He spoke against the Hebrew God uh, in their understanding. Uh, and, uh, and so then they take him across the street and say that he was fomenting rebellion. He was a king trying to be a king against Rome. And, and Pilate works this out uh, with him um, in, uh, in the Gospel of John. And Pilate says, I, I find no problem with him, but he's forced uh, by the political situation uh, into crucifying Jesus. Jesus is crucified by the misuse of the two voices of justice. Uh, and so we see it uh, occurring in that way. So our fourth point is I want to do a very quick, brief history of how those elements of justice sort of get addressed in the next 2,000 years after, uh, after the, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, uh, and how it happens in societies, Christian societies, and the first societies are mainly all Christian, in the Western world, and then, uh, and then they become more secular, uh, and how the pers personal and public realities uh, are affected. Generally, what we see is a split happening between personal elements and national justice. And by that, I mean an increasing feeling that if you have a personal problem, it's your personal problem, and just you know, stick with it. If you have a personal opinion, it's your personal opinion, and, uh, and it's not something to, uh, to bother the, uh, uh, the entire world about. But uh, the other push that's happening is, uh, is a sense, and it probably comes, it does come from, from, from the fairness that is in the Old and New Testament that is preached every, or at least manifested every week in these uh, Western medieval societies, uh, is that there should be some fairness, there should be some equality, there's something about how we all are equal under, under God, and how does this then happen, how does it develop in a, a public uh, situation? And the, the, the great example that we look at uh, is the, uh, the writing of the Magna Carta, uh, as uh, certain nobles got together and they uh, uh, got, were able to, to catch King John and force him to write that they had equal rights, uh, they had certain rights, and it was, it was the, the rights of the English uh, in that context. It's the England that allows these rights. Uh, okay, the Magna Carta is a symbol for the emergence in Western legality of the idea of, of equality of, of the rights of mankind, of humankind. Uh, the problem is, Historically, it was, it was just for those nobles. <laughs> but what happened as the Magna Carta is lifted up and as more and more people in society get a little power, it's extended, it's extended. So then it goes also to the wealthy merchants. It goes also to the lower nobility. It goes to, I'll tell you what, those are all males. Uh, eventually, uh, we see it going to, uh, to women in certain ways uh, and, uh, and so, this is the so sort of the story of public justice, is there is a, an ideal of equality, of, of, of equal fair, of fair, of fair play that it has to acknowledge and it has to uh, manifest. But what happens is that uh, it, it, it happens as a, as a very rough and difficult and hard-won extension of those rights to, uh, to more and more people. I'm sure you can think of um, examples uh, today. Uh, we, uh, the U.S. Constitution, Bill of Rights, uh, is a great example of how that becomes uh, an attempt for universal justice. And yet today we're also uh, asking, how does that relate to, to certain people groups who have defined themselves in certain ways? How does it uh, relate to uh, peoples of different culture who are living with us? Uh, and, uh, and so uh, th those problems are interesting, those problems are real. Uh, if universal relational justice is true, how, where, where are the gaps? Uh, and, uh, and do we have the energy, do we have the resources uh, to, uh, to address those, uh, those injustices? 
in that context, Christians um, are having to learn how to address their strong sense of what's valuable in a public context. And we do so well, and we do so not so well. I suggested earlier a, a story in which um, there was a teacher who was great at community, uh, but when she shifted into the public sphere, um, she didn't do that well. And, uh, and her, uh, uh, her, her language became something that was offensive and she lost her voice really in, in the public sphere. Uh, we have a situation today uh, in terms of evangelical Christians are recognized to be a large, important section of what's happening to us politically. And, uh, uh, and again, um, the question is, is that voice being expressed uh, helpfully? Um, I'm an evangelical Christian. I'm a white male. <laughs> uh, I regret uh, the fact that, that the way uh, that political group is coming across means that so many people of the United States can write me off uh, as, uh, as not an appropriate member of the, of, the, of the national community because I seem to, or I, it's not me, but evangelicals seem to be uh, concentrated so much on their own concerns that they don't seem to be able to speak the language of, of, of national reality. One political party, uh, to take one example, uh, very much puts forward the, the problem of abortion and how we can eliminate that uh, and, 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 and that form of murder in our nation. The other political party right now is saying a lot about babies in cages uh, and the destruction of life that happens in that way. I believe that the impulse for both those concerns are Christian. I believe they're both relational. I believe they're both deep and real. And so uh, what I'm saying is, we have a challenge, each, each one of us, and also our groups have a challenge uh, to somehow put forward public policies and public suggestions that uh, make it understood that our concerns are not just for me, uh, but our, our concerns are for the health of our nation uh, and, for, uh, uh, and for the value of, uh, of the country that we, we represent and that we would like to see continue in, in its uh, good strength. So, uh, but this too, and it's easy to get discouraged at that point and simply become privatized. But I, I would suggest that advocacy for justice is never off the table for the church. It's never off the table for Christians in their discernment to want to see today what is something wrong that we can write. I mean, I, I think when I say that, that phrase, I think of the whole area of nursing research, which usually takes, looks at a hospital and asks, you know, what's, what's going not quite right? What's the research that behind it? How can we affect the change? How can we make uh, a case in, a, uh, <clears throat> in, in the medical environment for something that relates to health care? Uh, that's something that will reduce costs, something that will increase patient uh, satisfaction, uh, that's the political argument in a, in a, in a hospital, uh, but underneath is the very profound and beautiful concern of nurses that people stop being hurt and that people get better sooner. So uh, some, uh, some ideas there. Let me draw some conclusions. Again, uh, I'll reaffirm that uh, since Florence Nightingale, Nursing has focused on justice uh, and advocacy. And we do have uh, political advocacy groups of, of nurses. ANA has a strong uh, branch for that. Uh, and uh, again, I, right now, these days, uh, what I hear is a strong nursing voice uh, asking about the, uh, uh, how it is that we can bring about um, health insurance for as many people as possible. I think that seems to me to be the most important or the, the primary political uh, concern of nurses as a group. Justice has to be uh, communally addressed and, and, uh, and communally pursued. I, I think, again, our, our sense of justice rightly comes from the connections that we have personally uh, and, 
and, and, and relationally, and it means it has to be uh, negotiated in, in that sense as well. We have to be aware of the two voices of, of justice. Uh, they're natural, in a sense, for nursing, both the individual sense of what, what is going wrong, the personal sense, but also the need to see things change uh, so that um, things need to reach, the things that people need uh, reach them in their way. I'll tell you, uh, one um, nursing voice I've always, and I'll just close with this comment, uh, one nursing voice I've always appreciated is the fact that uh, the League of Women Voters um, usually includes nursing uh, groups policies when they talk about the pros and cons of, uh, of uh, political uh, positions or, or, or uh, bills that come before the, the voters. Uh, and I think that's a good starting place to get other people aware of what nurses can say uh, as we, uh, okay, not only have a voice ourselves or concern for a voice of ourselves, but getting non-nurses to listen to what nurses wish to see on the political level and to see the values there. There's one example, I think. Uh, the League of Women Voters uh, presents itself as, as an unbiased um, resource. Uh, but it's nice to see the nursing voice there. All right, social justice. I hope this gives us some uh, things to talk about and think about, uh, and uh, we'll see you next week.